Hi, thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu. Today we are discussing the purpose of communion, looking at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 34. Life notes are available for download on our website at calvaryaz.com forward slash life notes. Now, here is Pastor Chad Garrison. I invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11 is our text. And if you don't have a Bible with you or a Bible app on your device, that's perfectly fine. Grab the Bibles, grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1139. That's 1139. You'll be able to find 1 Corinthians 11. You'll be able to follow along with us in that text. And, uh, and as always, if you're here in the room and you don't have a Bible and you want one, please take one. Uh, we want you to have God's Word and read God's Word. Uh, if you're joining us online and you don't have a Bible and you want one, uh, ask for one. We'll be glad to get you a Bible, uh, whether we have to mail it to you or deliver it to you, because we want everyone to have God's Word and read God's Word, because we know if you read and apply God's Word, God will change your life. Hey, uh, before we dive into the message today, uh, can I just tell you I'm excited about the baptisms tomorrow at the lake at 5 o'clock down at London Bridge Beach. Uh, if you don't know where London Bridge Beach is, go across the bridge, first left, right there at Havelina Cantina. Go on down. It's by the dog park and everything. We're going to meet at the stage. You can't miss the stage. It's right there, and we'll sign you up. Uh, we have, Pastor Pete was a little low on the number because he didn't check the latest. We have over 60 people signed up for baptism tomorrow. 60 people who are declaring that Jesus has changed their life unashamedly to the world. And, and so if you're not one of those and you want to be baptized tomorrow, you can still uh, just let us know tonight. Let one of the pastors know out front after the service uh, or just show up. We will be ready for you and we will celebrate with you as you declare your faith in Jesus. And, uh, and so, and we're not the only church doing lake baptism tomorrow. Hilltop's going to be doing it too. I talked to them. They're doing it on the other side of the lake uh, and other side of the channel. And they're going to have 15 more. It's a good day for Jesus tomorrow in Lake Havasu City. Can we just say that? So that's kind of an exciting thing. Now, the other thing that uh, I'm excited about is uh, the fact that it's life group signups. We have some specialized life groups. If you're not aware of those, we have groups like Grief Share and Divorce Care, which are great for those who are going through those experiences. Uh, I'd encourage you to check those out. And, uh, and of course, we have this group called Alpha. And some of you are like, hey, this is the first NFL weekend. Why are you not wearing your Cardinals jersey? And that's a fair question, because I almost always wear my Cardinals jersey on the first weekend of NFL football. And I am a huge fan of the Arizona Cardinals, but I'm a bigger fan of Alpha. And if you are, look, like, Alpha is for anybody, but if you are like somebody who's like checking out the church and you kind of really want to understand this Jesus thing, Alpha's for you. And if you're a brand new believer, like the 60 people getting baptized tomorrow, or people, you know, the 45 people who got baptized in June, or the people who are just like, I'm new to this Christianity, I believe, but I want to know more, Alpha's for you. And if you're somebody who's been going to church for 40 years, and you pretend like you know it, but you really don't know it, and you think, you know, I hope nobody asks me a Bible question, then Alpha is for you. I, I'm just encouraging you, go check it out, sign up. You will learn and you will get closer to Jesus if you take Alpha. So uh, big fan of all of our life groups. I want everybody in a life group. Uh, that's our goal here at Calvary. And because we know that life change happens in relationships and you're going to get those in life groups. Hey, today we are celebrating communion. Uh, so again, if you're at home, get those elements ready. And we're talking about communion. Uh, now, whether you call it communion or you grew up calling it the Eucharist or Lord's Supper, all Christian churches practice some observance of Jesus' death and resurrection. And uh, if you grew up Catholic, then you called it the Eucharist, and, uh, which means I give thanks, which I think is really cool. Uh, in the Greek, it means I give thanks. Uh, so, and Catholics teach this doctrine called transubstantiation. And uh, if you're a good Catholic, you know this. If you're, like, not a good Catholic, you don't. Uh, but uh, transubstantiation is a doctrine where they believe that when the priest blesses the, the bread and the wine, that it physically, the, at the very essence of its being, transforms into the body and blood of Jesus. That's why they're so guarded about who can take communion. That's why they're so guarded about the elements after the priest blesses them, because they really treat that like it's the body and blood of Jesus. 
Uh, and then if you grew up Lutheran or something like Lutheran, then they called it communion. And it's consubstantiation is what they believe in. And they teach this as part of a, being a good Lutheran. And it means that the bread and the wine spiritually change and Christ is spiritually present in the elements of communion. And, and what they call real presence. He's really present in that. And, and then if you grew up in a Reformed church, like Presbyterian or some other Reformed kind of uh, church, then uh, you call it communion and you practice real presence. Which means that nothing happens to the bread and the wine, or the bread and the juice, but Christ is especially present during the observation of the supper. And then if you grew up in the free church tradition, which if you don't know what that is, that's like Baptist uh, or most of the uh, uh, Pentecostal churches, uh, things like that, then, then, uh, then you, you basically call it the Lord's Supper is what I grew up hearing it called. Uh, we didn't trust people who called it communion. Uh, so <laughs> call it the Lord's Supper and the bread and juice simply remind us of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Now, if you haven't grown up in church at all, all this is just confusing. And I get that. So what we're going to try to do is answer some questions that the Apostle Paul raises in this passage and talk about and celebrate communion. Uh, read, let's read together 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 17. And again, this is the letter to a messed up church. Paul is talking to this church, and we've already gone through a lot of issues, and he, they're still having issues, and one of those is communion. So he says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order for that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or, you, or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. You can tell he's a little bit ticked, right? We'll talk about that. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. That's serious judgment right there. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. Uh, they had problems. They had lots of problems related to communion. Uh, and they were divided. And look, I already talked about the different theologies of communion, doctrines of communion that different churches have were divided over theology, but they were divided over practice and over the uh, morality, if you will, of communion. So I want to begin by discussing the purpose of communion. Why do we do this? Uh, now, there are reasons. There are always reasons why we do what we do. And if you're new to church, can I just say this? We do weird stuff. All right. If you grew up, how many of you grew up in church? Any kind of church. Okay, a lot of hands go up. How many of you, you're pretty new to church? Okay, that's okay to raise your hands. We're, we're, we're glad you're here. So, um, but if you're new to church, church is weird. I mean, it's really about the only place you sing together, you know, in a, in a public gathering, other than take me out to the ball game during the seventh inning stretch, right? Or the national anthem, right? Every, every, that's, it, we, we sing together. And, and, and then we do weird stuff like baptize people. You know, we're going to dunk somebody uh, underwater and hold them there for a second and then raise them up again. It's like we do that in our pool with kids, but you guys do it in church in front of a bunch of people or in the lake. That's, that's a little bit weird. 
it's got spiritual significance. We'll talk about that tomorrow at the lake. Uh, but, and then you do this communion thing where you're talking about eating and drinking a person's body and blood. It's kind of weird. And, and I get that. Communion, you know, we do strange stuff. But here's the thing. A lot of Christians never bother to learn the why behind the what. Why do we do this? But at Calvary, we want to talk about the why. We want to tackle the tough questions. We want to explain what we're doing. So uh, that's what we're going to do. The purpose of communion, first of all, is to unite us in Christ. To unite us. Uh, in, in chapter 11, verse 18, he says, for in the first place, when you come together as a church. And, and he talks about this in terms of problems, but he uses that phrase, come together, multiple times in this passage. It's to unite us. Communion first of all, is only for followers of Jesus. If you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, you believe that he was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then communion is something you do to celebrate Jesus' death on your behalf and his resurrection to, uh, from the dead. In other words, communion is a declaration again, to the world that Jesus is your savior, that you have surrendered your life to him, you know that your sins are forgiven, and you know that you're a child of God. Okay, that's who communion is for. Because for us who are followers, it is us saying Jesus is my savior, and I know that, and I'm once again, once again, it's a repetition thing, I'm committing myself to him. I'm saying Jesus, I surrender once again, Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus yet, we want you to become one, but communion's not for you. Right, look, we're not trying to be mean. We're not trying to be exclusive. It, it just, but if you haven't yet decided to follow Jesus, why would you want to take communion? If I just told you that communion is a declaration of faith in Jesus, it's saying that you surrender to Jesus, you know your sins are forgiven, you know that heaven is your destiny, um, then, then if you don't believe that, if you haven't made that commitment to follow Jesus, then then taking communion would actually be hypocrisy. Like Jesus was not in favor of hypocrisy in any way, shape, or form. We're not in favor of that at Calvary either. So uh, we're just honest about what it means and who it's for. See, communion ultimately is a statement of faith in Jesus and a reminder to all of us that position, wealth, status, or title means absolutely nothing before God. We are all saved by grace alone through faith in Jesus as Savior. That's it. We're all saved because Jesus died on the cross to pay for our sins, was raised from the dead, and we have said, Jesus, we need you to save us. And communion reminds us of that. Communion reminds us that, that in Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a king or a pauper. It doesn't matter if you're educated or, or illiterate. It doesn't matter if you're talented or a bumbling idiot. Okay, I'm just telling you, it doesn't matter. None of those things matter because Jesus loves you and he saves you, not because you're good, not because you're talented, not because you're smart. He saves you because you surrender to him. That's it. That's it. We're saved by grace, not by our goodness. We're saved by grace, not by what we do. And, and this unites us because, look, all of us deserve hell because of our rebellion, but because of Jesus' sacrifice, we get heaven. And that makes us one. That makes us equal at the foot of the cross, people. And if you don't see that, if you don't understand that, if you're still looking at other people and thinking, well, I'm better than they are, you don't get grace and how it works. You're not better than anyone else. You're just as lost as everyone else. And it's only through Jesus that you have hope. Um, so uh, none of us deserve it. None of us earn it. None of us, uh, you know, are going to get there without the mercy of Jesus. And, and that's beautiful. So when we, look, when we come to Christ at the table uh, to celebrate communion, it, it's the one place where we should go, hey, you know, why am, I, why am I taking shots at fellow believers? Why am I attacking other Christians? Why am I, you know, questioning them? Because in Christ, we are one. We have a lot more in common with other believers than separates us. So communion serves to unite us in Christ which is one of those interesting things that all the churches disagree about the differences. It's always been that way, and it probably will be until Jesus comes again and fixes us. So communion is to unite us in Christ, and communion is to remember Jesus' sacrifice. 
is to remember. Paul says in verse 23, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do this to remember. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, okay, in in the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This is to remind us about the sacrifice of Jesus, that he gave his body and his blood to redeem you and me from hell, to give us life and forgive us our sins. And can I just tell you that this truth should change our lives. The reality that we are forgiven in Christ should change our lives. When we reflect and remember, it leads us to gratitude and joy. It leads us to be thankful and it leads us to celebrate. Because again, I deserve death, I get life. I deserve hell, I get heaven. I deserve judgment, I get mercy. Why? Because of Jesus. Because he gave himself for us. So, um, You gotta be thankful because God loves you and sent Jesus to save you. Is anybody thankful because of that? Okay, well, I'm just wondering. You guys are all sitting there staring at me like, I don't know. (laughs) Maybe, maybe not. We ought to have joy because our sins are forgiven. The Holy Spirit is in us and heaven is our destiny. I mean, see, that's reason alone to celebrate. And the more we reflect on Jesus' death for us, the more gratitude and joy seep into our souls. That, so that's part of what communion is about, to help us remember. Now, I'm just gonna say this, and it might hurt a little bit, but some of us need to remember a whole lot more to be thankful and joyful. Some of us need to celebrate communion every day because we're not getting it. And, and, and this is to help us get to that place where we can look at our lives and go, Jesus, thank you, and celebrate. So the purpose of communion is to unite us in Christ, to remember Jesus' sacrifice, and it's to proclaim the gospel. To proclaim the gospel. Verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. At Calvary, we proclaim the gospel all the time. We're going to tell you how Jesus can change your life uh, all the time because we get excited about that. But here's the thing. Communion is a way of reminding us that the gospel applies to us, to me. And and if people are are with us and, and we're celebrating communion, we can explain the strange thing that we do to remember that Jesus loves us enough to give himself for us so that our sins can be forgiven. And and it focuses focuses us. That's I shouldn't have written it that way. It causes us to focus back to the hope of life in Jesus and reminds us that there is a world desperate to know him and the hope that we have. It's a way of, uh, of just saying Jesus died for us and to save people from their sins. So communion reminds us we're forgiven, but it also reminds us that our family and our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers can be forgiven when they surrender to Jesus as well. That's why if you're here If you're joining us online and you're not yet a follower of Christ, we want to encourage you today to make that decision to surrender to Jesus. He's the only one who can forgive you of your sins. He's the only one who can promise you eternal life. He's the only one who can take you to heaven. And and we are just encouraging you just to say yes to Jesus. The words of Jesus, John chapter three, he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. Romans 10, the Apostle Paul says, if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. This is your act of just saying, Jesus, I need you. I surrender. I want to follow you. And he will save you. Now, by the way, if you make that decision today, we want to to know, we want to celebrate with you. Our prayer team will be here at the front. They would love to pray with you and talk with you about next steps. Our pastors will be out in the foyer. Please let one of us know that you've made this decision to follow Jesus or just grab one of the connect cards and fill it out and say, I trusted Jesus. I want to talk to a pastor about next steps. Now, if you're really bold, you make that decision, show up tomorrow, get baptized at the lake. We'll all celebrate with you. So that's the purposes that Paul outlines in this passage. But there's also a rebuke 
in this passage. So let's talk about the warning about communion. Uh, in verse 27, he says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Um, Paul is irritated at the blatant selfishness of some of the believers in Corinth. Now, earlier he expresses that. Uh, and and uh, instead of communion being a time of worship for them, uh, it had become a time of selfish indulgence and excess. So what was going on? They were doing communion as a BYOS, bring your own supper. Okay? They're like, we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, so everybody bring their stuff. And instead of it being a potluck where everybody's sharing, everybody had their own meal. So if you were poor, you showed up with bread and water. If you were rich, you showed up with filet mignon, crab legs, and wine. And people were going hungry while other people were stuffing themselves and getting drunk. That's what was going on in the church, and they called it celebrating the Lord's Supper. And Paul says, you're making an abomination of this. This is evil. This is not good because you're being a gluttonous and drunkard while other people are hungry, and you're doing it in the name of Jesus. And he said, stop. By the way, this is probably why we get these little tasteless crackers and sh mini shot glasses of juice <laughs> for communion. Okay, I always wondered that as a kid. Now I think I, I understand it. Because we're not going to be like the Corinthians. You know, we're not going to give you a chance to overeat and get drunk. Uh, but Paul is rebuking them for being self-centered and blasphemous. He's rebuking them for dividing the, the church, the body of Christ, when communion should be bringing them together to worship and celebrate Jesus. He says, look, uh, you are experiencing God's judgment and correction because what you're doing is evil. He said, this is so bad that some of you are sick because of it. Some of you have died. God killed some of you to get your attention. And you're still not paying attention. And some of you are like, does God still do that? And I'm like, he did it then. I don't know. Uh, the, uh, now here's the thing. We don't have that issue with communion today. You know, the tasteless crackers and mini shot glasses have fixed that. But, um, but we still need to heed the warning that Paul is, is challenging the church. And so listen again to what he says in verses 27 through 29. He says, whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. Um, look, Paul is warning the Corinthian church to take communion seriously. Take it seriously. Uh, for its purposes, to unite, to remember, to proclaim. Don't profane the Lord's table. So, so then the question is, how do we need to hear that warning? How do we need to understand this warning to us today as we observe communion? And, and here at Calvary, in case you're wondering, we, we observe communion about once a month. I'm not ordered enough or compulsive enough to have it on the same week. Some of you are frustrated by that. Uh, and uh, we do it different ways, depending on the season. In just a minute, you know, in a few minutes, you're going to get up and walk around to tables and get it. And I know that may not be as worshipful for you, but um, it still can be. But, but here's what I, I want us to get. Communion is not a religious ritual. It is a practice of reflection and repentance. Okay, it's not a ritual. There's a lot of people who think, well, if I take communion, that's gonna help me get closer to Jesus. No. Some people think, well, if I take communion, that's gonna help me be forgiven for what I've sinned. No. Some people think, well, it's gonna help me, uh, God's gonna do you know, more stuff for me if I take communion because it's being a good Christian. No. None of those things are true. It's not religious practice. Taking communion doesn't do a thing for you if your heart isn't right if it's not surrendered to Christ. And so it, it, it really is about uh, us examining ourselves to confess our sins and to repent, to recommit our lives to Jesus so that we can live for him. After all, we are not our own. We were bought with a price. So we're to glorify God with our bodies. Now, that's what he taught what I want us to do is to practice that. 
Uh, and, and we don't usually, I mean, we always give you some time at, when we take communion to reflect. I always kind of give instructions like, hey, you have a conversation with Jesus. And, and we give you a couple, three minutes, four minutes to do that. And, and some people are like, can we have more time? So tonight you're going to get a little bit more time. Because what I want to do is I want to lead us through a time of reflection and repentance. And, and, and you may be comfortable with this. You may not be comfortable with this. That's okay. Um, you may want to close your eyes and just uh, listen and pray because there's going to be some silence. We'll have some music playing. Um, we're not going to take communion right now, so we're getting ready for that. But what we want to do is examine ourselves. And I'm going to ask you four questions over the next few minutes. And I want you to reflect on them. I want you to talk with God about them. And, and I want you to, um, to get ready to remember Jesus' death and resurrection. So the first thing that I would love for you to reflect on is what are the sins that you need to confess? What are the sins that you need to confess? Um, scripture says, the Apostle John says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You see, you receive that grace from God, not because you take communion, but because you confess your sins. And so take a few moments and think about your life, what you're doing to disobey God, and take some time to just pray and confess and repent. Then I would challenge you to ask yourself the question, who do I need to forgive? Who do I need to forgive? Who has hurt me that I need to extend grace to? Who is the person that I need to forgive? You may need to forgive God if you feel like he's let you down. You may need to forgive yourself. Or you may need to ask someone else to forgive you. So who is it in your life that needs the grace of Jesus? Then reflect on what is it that you need to say yes to? What is the o obedience that you need to embrace? God is calling you to do something for him. He's calling you to serve. He's calling you to obey. He's calling you to follow. What is the yes that God wants from you for your life?
Finally, would you reflect on the gratitude and joy you have for the love of God for you and the forgiveness of Jesus for all your sins? We talked about gratitude. We talked about joy. Spend a few moments just thanking God and celebrating in your heart for his amazing love and incredible grace for you. Father, tonight we praise you because you're a God who not only hears our prayers, but desires to engage with us in a personal relationship. Lord, sometimes we get too busy to pause and pray. Sometimes we get too busy to reflect on our life, but you are always working in our lives. You're always calling us into relationship. You're always calling us into repentance. You're always calling us into grace and into service. You invite us to live a life of gratitude and joy because we've gotten way better than we deserve. And so we thank you. We thank you for a love that will not let us go. We thank you for a grace that is undeserved and all encompassing and forgives us of all our sins. We thank you for the privilege of being able to represent you to a world that doesn't know you, the privilege of being your servants, the servants of the living God. And so, Father, fill us with a heart that is thankful and a spirit that is joyful because we know we're getting, we know we're getting heaven when we deserve hell. We know we're getting life when we deserve death. We know we're getting love when we deserve judgment. So, Father, simply be present and be real in our hearts and our lives because we want to be transformed by you. And we want to recommit ourselves to living and loving and serving our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. As Pastor Chad said, communion is not a religious ritual, but a practice of reflection and repentance. If today's message spoke to you and you'd like to support the ministry of Calvary, you can do so by visiting our website, calvaryaz.com. The homepage has links to contact us, to give, listen to past sermons, and subscribe to the Word for the Day daily devotionals. Well, that'll do it for today. I hope you'll join us again next week. Bye-bye.